This video is brought to you by Sheath Underwear, which is completely revolutionizing the men's underwear game. Look, gentlemen, how many times have you been out and about on the town and things are just not going too well down there, you know? It's too hot, it's too sticky, things are just uncomfortable, and look, adjusting yourself, it's not a good look. Fortunately, there is sheath underwear, which is specially built with you in mind. It's got three individual compartments in here, which uh, basically keep everything cool and separate and comfortable. And by separate, we mean your dick and balls being separate in this thing. It sounds weird, buy it, try it, and then you'll be like, okay, we'll buy more because it's just better. <laughs> sheath was invented by a literal US Army soldier when he was in Iraq because well, apparently it gets quite warm there. Trust me, modern underwear that is ergonomically designed for the shape of your body is just something that you should definitely try. There's less chafing, there's less sticking, there's less smelling, there's less adjusting yourself in public. So if you're still buying your underwear from the same brand that makes your socks, your undershirts, and possibly your sister's bra, maybe it's time to give something a little more personalized a try. Right now, you guys can get 20% off sheath underwear by just clicking the link below and using the code BRAINFOOD at checkout. Alternatively, go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash brainfood. That's the same deal, 20% off. Do it and your equipment will thank you. Again, that's sheathunderwear.com forward slash brainfood. I'll just click the link below for 20% off with the code BRAINFOOD. And now, today's video. In our previous video, the surprisingly long and determined effort to create a literal flying tank, we looked at how designers in the 1930s and 40s devoted a considerable amount of time and effort trying to combine two of the 20th century's most revolutionary weapons of war. The tank and the aeroplane. But as ill-conceived and ultimately futile as these projects were, they were far from the strangest attempts to create a hybrid military vehicle. That dubious distinction instead belongs to an improbable series of efforts to mash together the two unlikeliest of vehicles, the airplane and the submarine. It will come as no surprise to regular viewers of this channel that the First Nation to tinker with such a vehicular abomination was, of course, the Soviet Union. In 1937, while studying at the Dzinsky Naval Engineers Academy in St. Petersburg, Soviet engineer Boris Ushakov drafted a technical proposal for a vehicle which could both operate in the air and underwater. Featuring thick, stubby wings resembling a manta ray and a pair of floats for takeoff and landing, Ushakov's flying submarine would be powered by three 800 horsepower gasoline engines on the surface and an electric motor underwater, giving it a maximum speed of 100 knots in the air and three knots submerged. Once the craft landed, the transition from airplane to submarine would be accomplished by sealing off the engine compartments with retractable metal plates and flooding empty spaces in the wings and floats, causing the aircraft to submerge. The cockpit would also be flooded, forcing the crew to retreat into a watertight compartment, complete with a conning tower and periscope from which the submarine would be controlled. The craft's armament was to be two 18-inch torpedoes mounted under the hull. But what possible use could any navy have for such an outlandish vehicle? Now, as absurd as it might seem, Ushakov's concept actually filled a number of roles that aircraft and submarines of the time just could not. While fast, agile, and able to carry large weapons payloads, aircraft of the 1930s were far from stealthy, a fact which became increasingly relevant with the wide-scale adoption of radar. On the other hand, submarines, while stealthy, were also extremely slow underwater and largely blind, relying on periscopes and hydrophones to track and home in on their targets. Aircraft and submarines were also largely ill-suited to attacking enemy ships in harbor, which were typically defended by extensive anti-aircraft batteries and anti-submarine obstacles like booms and nets. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, there were numerous attempts to solve these tactical shortcomings, such as the development by several nations of midget submarines capable of infiltrating harbors and other protected spaces. This approach was pioneered by the Italian Navy, whose elite Decima Flottiglia MAS unit of combat frogmen used specially designed human torpedoes nicknamed Miley or Pigs to carry out a series of daring raids against Allied shipping in Alexandria, Malta, and Gibraltar. The Miley were copied by the British, who dubbed them chariots, and along with more conventional midget submarines known as X craft, used in several unsuccessful attempts to sink German battleship to pits at her anchorage in Norway. Japanese Type A Ko Hayataki's midget submarines participated in the 19th 41 attack on Pearl Harbor and two 1942 attacks on Sydney Harbor and Diego Suarez Harbor in Madagascar, while various German midget submarines like the Neger, Seehund, and Biber carried out attacks on Allied shipping in the English Channel in the final years of the war. However, none of these vehicles proved as effective as their designers had hoped. 
For one thing, they had a limited range, requiring them to be carried close to their target, launched, and then retrieved by a larger mother submarine. They were also slow, difficult to control, and despite their small size, easily spotted and engaged by enemy defensive forces. Consequently, the vast majority of midget submarine operators ended in the death or capture of their crews. Another potential solution to the stealth versus speed conundrum was the submarine aircraft carrier. In the 1920s, a number of submarines were built to carry a small reconnaissance float plane and a special watertight hangar behind the conning tower. Once the submarine had surfaced, the aircraft would be removed from its hangar, assembled, and launched using a steam catapult built into the deck. Upon completing its mission, the aircraft would land alongside the submarine and be hoisted aboard using a crane. While both the French Sukhouf and British HMS M2 cruiser submarines possessed this capability, the most famous submarine aircraft carriers ever built were the Japanese I-400 class. The largest submarines ever fielded during World War II and the largest ever built until the 1960s, the I-400s were designed to carry and launch three Aichi M6A Siren float planes. These were each capable of carrying 900 kilograms of bombs. The Japanese Navy planned to use these unusual weapons to attack the Panama Canal, San Diego, and Elysee Atoll, but Japan surrendered before any of these plans could be carried out. The three completed I-400s were captured by the Americans, examined, and scuttled to prevent the Soviets from learning their technological secrets. But. As impressive as they were, the I-400 suffered from a fatal flaw. Launching and retrieving aircraft took up to 45 minutes and could only be done while these submarines were on the surface, making them highly vulnerable to detection and attack. Boris Ushkov's flying submarine, on the other hand, neatly solved this problem. The craft could theoretically cover vast distances of ocean at high speeds, allowing it to track down and shadow an enemy fleet. It could then land, submerge, and use the cover of darkness to attack the fleet before stealthily slipping away. The craft was also well suited to infiltrating harbors, able to fly over minefields, anti-submarine nets, and other defenses before landing in the harbor basin, submerging, and attacking enemy shipping using torpedoes. Indeed, the Soviet Navy saw sufficient merit in Ushakov's idea to submit his proposal to its scientific research committee for evaluation. But while the concept made it through two rounds of critical evaluations and revisions, it was ultimately rejected as too impractical, and Ushakov's vehicular chimera never made it off the drawing board. But the allure of the flying submarine ever truly died, and the following decades would see numerous attempts to resurrect the concept. In 1961, American inventor Donald V. Reed of Ocean Township, New Jersey, cobbled together various discarded aircraft parts to create a working flying submarine, which he rather unimaginatively dubbed the Reed Flying Submarine, or RFS-1. Though far smaller than Ushkov's design is only 10 meters in length, Reed's vehicle worked on exactly the same principle. Looking like something out of a contemporary James Bond movie, in the air, RFS-1 was powered by a 65-horsepower engine and propeller mounted on a tall pylon behind the cockpit. When underwater, it was powered by a one-horsepower electric motor, diving being accomplished by flooding the craft's fuselage and twin pontoons. The transition from flying to diving, however, was a less-than-elegant process, requiring the pilot to remove the propeller and seal off the engine pod using a rubber cloth cover. The craft's open cockpit also required the pilot to use scuba gear to breathe while submerged. Nonetheless, on June 9, 1964, RFS-1 made the world's first and thus only full-cycle flying submarine flight over the Shrewsbury River, flying at 10 meters altitude before submerging and achieving a speed of two knots at a depth of two meters. While the craft's immense weight limited it to making short, low-altitude hops, Reed proved that a flying submarine was a workable proposition, inspiring dozens of future efforts to perfect the concept. In the same year as Reed's historic flight, the proceedings of the U.S. Naval Institute published a study by naval hydrodynamics engineer Eugene Handler examining the feasibility of a flying submarine. As in Boris Ushakov's original 1937 concept, such crafts were envisioned for use against enemy shipping in harbor or in closed, heavily defended waters like those of the Baltic, Black, or Caspian Seas. As the Navy article states, Handler writes of a possible craft with an operating depth of 25 to 75 feet, a submerged speed of 5 to 10 knots for 4 to 10 hours, airspeed of 150 to 225 knots for 2 or 3 hours, and a payload of 5 500 to 1,500 pounds. He says it is believed these characteristics can be attained within a vehicle weighing 12,000 to 15,000 pounds. A little flying sub might carry out its mission and take its crew back. It could 
Handler says, fly from a favorable location to its destination at minimum altitude to avoid detection by radar. At the completion of its underwater mission, it could travel as a submersible to a location best suited for takeoff, become airborne, and return to base. The Bureau of Naval Weapons has recently awarded a contract to the Convair and Electric Boat Divisions of General Dynamics for analytical and design studies of the essential components and operational aspects of such a vehicle. In the same article, Handler also acknowledges the various technical and bureaucratic obstacles which had long held back the development of a flying submarine, stating that the development of a practical flying submarine prototype will be both complex and laborious, but the potential returns are substantial and valuable. Consequently, the concept of such a vehicle merits careful engineering examination rather than the overly optimistic accolade of a few imaginative enthusiasts and the simultaneous cold shoulder denial of the hard-headed realist. Inevitably, like every other flying submarine project, Handler's concept also never made it off the drawing board. However, it may have directly inspired an iconic piece of pop culture. While developing the 1965 television series Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, producer Erwin Allen hired researcher Elizabeth Manuel to compile an archive of existing underwater technology on which to base the show's vehicles and props. Among the material Emmanuel uncovered in her research was the US Navy's flying submarine study, which is thought to have inspired the very similar Stingray shaped vehicle prominently featured in the show and which first introduced the concept of the flying submarine to the general public. One of the fundamental flaws with the flying submarine concept is the need for a strong watertight compartment for the crew, which significantly increases the weight of the vehicle and makes it difficult to achieve flight. If the crew are eliminated altogether, however, then this particular engineering problem suddenly becomes a whole lot simpler. The first attempt to launch an unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV from submarines was made in 1946, when a US-built version of the World War II German V-1 cruise missile called the JB-2 Loon was test launched from the deck of the USS Cusk. These experiments ultimately resulted in the development of the SMN-8 Regulus, the US Navy's first submarine-launched nuclear missile. While a significant leap forward, the Regulus was a fundamentally flawed weapon. Carried in special watertight compartments built into the submarine's hull, the Regulus could only be extracted and launched once the submarine had surfaced. This made Regulus-equipped submarines extremely vulnerable to detection and attack, just like the Japanese I-400 submarines before them. This problem was eventually solved by the development of Polaris and Trident ballistic missiles and the Tomahawk cruise missile, which could be launched while the submarine remained safely submerged. In 1991, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START, signed by the United States and the Soviet Union, left the US Navy wondering what to do with half of its ballistic missile submarines whose nuclear payloads had been outlawed by the treaty. This resulted in a flurry of proposals for alternative non-nuclear weapons to occupy this considerable underwater real estate. Among these was Project Cormorant, first proposed in 2003 by DARPA, the Pentagon's Advanced Research Projects Agency. Officially designated the Multi-Purpose Unmanned Area vehicle, or MPUAV, the Comorant was a six-meter-long jet-powered drone designed to be launched from a submarine missile tube. Pushed out of the launch tube by compressed air, the Comorant would rise to the surface before being launched into the air by a pair of rocket boosters. The wings would then unfold, the jet engine inlet and outlet would open, and the vehicle would fly off on its reconnaissance mission, covering a distance of up to 800 kilometers. Upon completing its mission, the Comorant would return and parachute into the sea, whereupon the launching submarine would deploy a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, to attach a cable to the drone, allowing it to be winched back into its launch tube. But hardly the exotic convertible vehicle of Boris Ushakov and Donald Reed's imaginations, the Comorans nonetheless solved the decades-long problem of combining the speed and maneuverability of an aircraft with the stealth of a submarine. Unfortunately, in 2008, the MPUAV project fell victim to budget cuts, and like all of its predecessors, the Comorant was never built. Yet Ushkov's dream still lives on, and shortly after the cancellation of the project, the Naval Surface Weapons Center in Cader Rock, Maryland, released yet another proposal for a true flying submarine. Six meters long, with a 30-meter wingspan, the vehicle was designed to carry two crew and six Special Forces troops up to 1,200 kilometers by air or 20 kilometers underwater. While it is yet unknown whether the Cader Rock flying submarine was ever built and tested, the fact that this absurd James Bond-esque vehicle continues to capture the imagination of naval designers after nearly a century just goes to show that sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.